Good morning from Los Angeles. My name is Sharona Vise, and I'm proud to serve as co-president of the Daughters of Shiva. On behalf of the Western Region of American Friends of Shiva Medical Center and my fellow Daughters of Shiva, thank you for participating in today's program and covering the latest innovations in women's healthcare. Today, we are incredibly fortunate to be joined by Dr. Avisur, the director of Sheba's brand new Women's Health Innovation Center that launched in Israel at Sheba during the height of the pandemic. He is here with us live from Tel Aviv to present on his groundbreaking innovations and answer any and all of your questions. Dr. Sur, we are so grateful for your time and dedication to revolutionizing women's health in Israel and across the globe. Today and always, Shiva serves as an oasis of coexistence and cooperation in the Middle East. Even underground amid the growing unrest in Israel, Shiva continues to save lives and provide hope without boundaries to all parties without distinction. To tell us more about the critical work of the Medical Center and to moderate today's program, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the CEO of American Friends of Sheba, Brian Abrahams. Thank you very much, Sharona. And I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us for this North American webinar. We'd like to also welcome our wonderful neighbors to the North, all the members of the Canadian Friends of Sheba who are joining us, led by my uh, incredibly talented colleague, uh, Inat Enbar. So uh, wel welcome to everybody. We're uh, grateful to the two national board members who are with us, Shoshana Zar, the vice chair of the American Friends of Sheba, and Ruth Steinberger, who's the board secretary for the American Friends of Sheba. And we welcome all the members of the Western Region Board and are grateful to uh, the Daughters of Sheba, which is an initiative of the Western Region. And for all of you for taking time on a Sunday. It's a, the, uh, for those of us in the Northern climates, the weather is turning nicer. There's a lot of choices you have with your time. And we appreciate you taking some of it to learn about this program. It's been obviously, I don't have to tell you, an extremely difficult few weeks for all of Israel, and that means Sheba too. Sheba Medical Center on a, on a good day, in a good week, touches, uh, or in the course of a year, touches almost 20% of Israeli society and is really a central part of Israel's health ecosystem. It was founded in 1948 as, as Israel's national hospital and is a, a, an incredibly important part of, of what goes on today. And there was a, I don't know if you saw this in the news, there was a rocket strike just a thousand meters. You know, Iron Dome is great, but it's not perfect, and some rockets do get through. And there was a rocket strike in Ramakan, a thousand meters from Sheba Medical Center, as they were working to save lives and protect people. And what they did, they have a, there's an unfortified underground parking garage at, at the medical center, which was built as a bomb shelter, also that's equipped to be an ICU. It was turned into a, a COVID ICU during COVID. The prime minister put Sheba Medical Center in charge of uh, the COVID response for all of Israel, as you know, Israel was one of the most successful countries in the world with COVID, and Sheba led the effort. And so they turned a parking garage into an ICU for COVID, and it was a great sign of progress a couple weeks ago when that parking garage went from a, a turned back into a parking garage. It was no longer an ICU. And then sure enough, within a week or 10 days, it was turned back into an ICU. First, they moved uh, the NICU patients, the neonatal care, uh, the youngest, the smallest babies, were moved in the tiny little bassinets and in their in cribs into this fortified underground shelter. Then came the oncology patients. Imagine going through inpatient cancer treatment and then having to pack up everything and rush down to an underground uh, parking garage, which is now gonna be your, your room, windowless room. And then came orthopedic patients. But I'm, I'm happy to tell you that as of this morning, it is now empty again, and it is once again going to be a parking garage. Uh, we, we pray for, for nothing but peace, but certainly it, it may well be that, that it's not always going to be a parking garage. We hope that doesn't happen. But it's a sign of Sheba's adaptability and their role in this. And, and Shoshana, uh, Sharona mentioned um, an oasis of, of coexistence. You know, Sheba's, the percentage of Arab Israelis on Sheba staff is 25%, which is greater than the percentage of Arab Israelis in the Israeli population as a whole. And it, it, this was a difficult time even for the staff, but there were uh, groups of Arab and uh, Israeli and Jewish Israeli staff who got together and held up signs about coexistence. At Sheba, uh, you may have heard that there was a, a, a Jewish man who was uh, beaten and ultimately succumbed to his, his wounds. 
in a, in a pogrom, essentially, in a, in a violent mob action, and multiple organs of his were used to save lives. And his heart was, uh, was transplanted in, in, at Sheba into someone. So Sheba has been central and will continue to be central. Today, we're going to hear about an aspect of, of uh, a really interesting, fancy aspect of Sheba's work. We're going to have Dr. Avi Tsur, who's an MD, who's an OBGYN and a high-risk pregnancy expert at the Sheba Medical Center. He directs the Sheba Women's Health Innovation Center, as well as Women's Health Care Services at Sheba Beyond, the virtual hospital. His passion for innovation and redesigning healthcare goes back to his first year as an OBGYN resident. Following the very preterm birth of one of his patients, Avi invented the Lioness, an innovative, non-invasive mechanical device for prevent, preventing a preterm birth, which has been endorsed by many international clinical leaders, such as Professor Nicolaitis, and is currently under clinical investigation. An important part of Avi's clinical training was during his three years at Stanford University, and Avi remains affiliated with Stanford with important ongoing collaboration he'll share with us today. Or his, uh, Avi and his wife, Orit, are the parents of four boys, Lavi 10, Arbel 8, Nevo 5, and Milo 2, and are expecting their fifth. So if we have time for questions, I may have some questions for Avi about that. Um, they, the family loves hiking during the weekends when Avi isn't the clinical service or on call. And their favorite hike ever, which they hope to return to soon, is Yosemite National Park in California. Obviously, to facilitate Q&A, you can use the chat box at the, uh, at, on the right side. And so you, if you have questions as Avi goes, put them in the chat box. We're gonna, he's actually going to break his presentation into three segments. And after each segment, I'll take questions. So if you have a question as he's going, put it in the chat box so we can have it when he's finished with his uh, presentation. Without further ado, an amazing physician and healer, uh, Dr. Avi Tsur. Thank you, Sharona and Brian. Please allow me to share my screen. And thank you very much, the American and Canadian Friends of Sheba, for your longstanding support of the Sheba Medical Center and for joining us today. It's a great pleasure for me to share with you our ongoing work aiming to improve women's health care. We would, of course, uh, prefer to meet in person, and I hope we will indeed do so in the near future. As a way of uh, introduction, so you can uh, know me better, I will start with a short story about my late grandfather, Professor Joseph Mendel Yoffe. Here in a picture with uh, Professor Albert Sabin, inventor of the polio vaccine. I've always looked up to my grandfather as a role model for the work of a physician scientist. However, more than his many accomplishments and discoveries, I was most excited of the tremendous struggle involved in each of the scientists scientific and clinical paradigm shifts he has led. Here is a vignette from a letter one of his senior colleagues wrote about him regarding his appointment to chair of anatomy at Bristol University. The senior colleague was evidently pleased with my grandfather's attributes and qualifications, but had some reservation about his research. If only he weren't interested in such completely dull and useless cells. This, the year is 1941, and the cells mentioned are stem cells. And indeed, through all stations of my career, I learned that there always, there's always reluctance to embrace change. Starting as a young officer in the IDF, inventing the lioness for preventing preterm birth until endorsement of Professor Nicolaitis. The first study is using artificial intelligence in maternal, in maternal fetal medicine and our recent efforts to introduce maternal fetal telemedicine. Perhaps best stated by Professor David Stevenson, one of my mentors at Stanford during his leadership award talk. Crazy ideas are only crazy until they are not. Understand that failure is on the same path as success. However, although innovation will always require blood, toil, tears, and sweat, I must admit that the current ecosystem at Chiba since ARC was launched make things much easier. Chiba, under the leadership of Professor Price fosters innovation. ARC, under the, under the leadership of Eyal Simlichman, created an environment expediting the development 
of new innovate inventions and removing many of the hurdles associated with new collaborations with industry or other institutions. The OBGYN department, under the leadership of Professor Ayal Sivan, is hungry to adopt any new technology that in can improve women's healthcare. Galia Barkai's vision for Shiba Beyond, the first virtual hospital in Israel, is nothing less than spectacular. While Professor Katoza is leading the Gertner Institute into the 21st century, shifting the focus from local health policy to global impact. The new Women's Health Innovation Center I will present today is a collaborative effort of all these excellent, sco excellent scores, ARC, the OBGYN department, Shiba Beyond, Gertner Institute, and biotech companies, driving innovation in women's healthcare. Today, I will focus on three themes of innovation, artificial intelligence, telemedicine, and precision medicine. I would start with artificial intelligence. So both in obstetrics and in gynecology, prediction is key to prevention. By the way, the fetus in the picture is our, our fifth. We are expecting him this summer. The picture was taken uh, around 10 weeks ago when he was only 17 weeks gestation. Anyway, back to work. Only if we predict increased risk for preeclampsia can we attempt preventive treatment with aspirin. And only if we predict increased risk for ovarian cancer, such as among women with BRCA, we will offer them preventive cancer, preventing cancer by surgically removing the breast and ovaries when childbearing is complete. Excuse me for a second. Unfortunately, we are unable to predict many of the complications we aim to prevent. With the hallmark of unpredictable complication until recently being shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia is an obstetric emergency defined as difficulty in delivering the newborn shoulders after successful delivery of the head. Once shoulder dystocia occurs, even if all actions are properly taken, there is an increased risk for permanent neonatal and maternal injury. So of course, if we were able to predict these complications, we would recommend cesarean delivery to prevent it. Over the century since the first publication about shoulder dystocia in the New England Journal of Medicine, seminal studies revealed important associations between shoulder dystocia and various risk factors such as diabetes and increased fetal weight. However, these associations are not enough to predict shoulder dystocia. And therefore, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, similar to other societies worldwide, defined shoulder dystocia as an unpredictable and unpreventable obstetric emergency. This point emphasizes the advantage of artificial intelligence, or more specifically, machine learning. While classical statistic methods, such as logistic regression, are designed for inference about relations between variables, Machine learning is designed for prediction. So with understanding that there are unmet problems in obstetrics and gynecology that we could solve with the use of machine learning, and with the knowledge about our incredible electronic health records in Shiba of over 100,000 deliveries over the last 10 years, I was sitting uh, on the bench next to one of the playgrounds at Stanford, while my eldest kid, Levi, found a new friend named Meitar. Apparently Meitar's father, now Professor Dvira Ran, happened to be one of the finest data scientists around. And so started our collaboration. Though they, those days uh, Dvir was at UCSF. Meanwhile, he has returned to Israel as well to establish the Biosen Bioscience Cathedra at the Haifa Institute of Technology, we call the Technion. So I won't be going too much into the boring details. To make a long story short, we developed a machine learning model for prediction of shoulder dystocia based on Shiba's data. The model showed very good predictive performance among Shiba deliveries, 
outperforming the current paradigm based on estimated fetal weight alone, alone or with gestational diabetes. We validated the model predictive performance and perhaps more importantly, clinical performance among deliveries from UCSF, Stanford, and most recently, the University of Texas, Houston. And just to clarify what I mean by clinical efficacy, among delivery, deliveries at the University of Texas, we were able to identify a risk score cutoff that would reduce the rate of shoulder dystocia in 53% compared to the current paradigm, while also reducing the rate of cesarean deliveries for big babies. This is all really, really exciting. And based on this success, we have meanwhile moved forward and we are developing simultaneously our next generation of AI calculators predicting other complications, such as unplanned cesarean delivery, trial of labor after cesarean, and prediction of fetal growth. Um, maybe I won't go into details, but our next, generator, next generation calculators don't only use data, but rather integrate ultrasound and fetal heart rate data into prediction. Here you can see our platform birth AI. And maybe before we move to discussion about artificial intelligence in maternal fetal medicine, I must share with you our vision. So our hope is that uh, the day will come not too far that any patient, any woman, and any physician worldwide can enter the data into our calculators or possibly have their EHR system collected to our calculators so they can uh, uh, reach out to Sheba's advice from beyond, be them in the United States or in Africa, and of course in Israel. Brian, are you with well, us? Well, Avi, I have so many questions for you, but let me follow on that point there. Help me, for, for those of us that are not as uh, smart, so what, what is, the, if you could do me in short layman's per, uh, layperson's terms, what data gets entered that predicts shoulder dystocia? So specifically for shoulder dystocia, let me show you there. We found 18 features that are predictive. The red features, such as uh, estimated fetal weight or pregestational diabetes are predictive of shoulder dystocia. Wow, okay. The green, the green features, uh, such as BPD, that's a sonographic measurement of fetal uh, head diameter or maternal height, a protective of shoulder dystocia. And we integrate these 18 parameters for each patient to predict their personal risk for shoulder dystocia. So what happens, Avi, in the third world when a baby is, or you know, a place with a less sophisticated medical environment, what happens with a, a baby that has shoulder dystocia on delivery? So, so actually, it doesn't matter. You can be in a sophisticated uh, Western country or in Africa. Once shoulder dystocia occurs, it's totally uh, your dependent in your manual ability to release the shoulders. And uh, it doesn't matter where you are, there's no uh, technology that can help you at that time point. Um, and even if you do everything correctly, uh, the baby's arm and the baby's uh, neurovasculature can be injured. So uh, the best way to prevent shoulder dystocia harm is to prevent it from happening by predicting it and for those at high risk going for cesarean delivery. Great, so to tie to that, I, I know that one of your personal missions of your center is to bring first rate OBGYN care to women in developing countries. Can you tell us more about that? Are, are there any specific countries you're focusing on? And how do you do that from Israel? Oh, that, that, that's, a that's a really big question. And you know, I, I think it may be better to answer it after we talk a bit about uh, telemedicine and remote care because you know, if we, want, if we want to reach these countries and we indeed really want to, it's not enough developing AI calculators. It's uh, much more about being able to uh, evaluate and talk with the patients remotely. And I think let's keep these questions after we talk about telemedicine. So, uh, oh, you're gonna have a segment on telemedicine? Yes. Great, okay. Um, let me ask you a question about, uh, we've got a question about COVID-19. Does the COVID-19 vaccine affect a woman's cycle? Oh, that's a big question. That's a really big question. You only have two I, minutes to answer it. <laughs> that's a really big question. And you know, 
I'll, I'll tell you one thing about it. Um, um, data is being gathered about that, and it's not for me now to uh, make the final uh, call. Does it affect? Does it affect the cycle? I must say that from my point of view, although it's really important for us that uh, women and men and everybody takes the vaccine and stop this uh, stop this uh, uh, COVID nineteen situation, I think it's really important that we are transparent about side effects of the vaccine. Uh, include, including a possible effect on a uh, menstrual cycle. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to try to come up with a non-conventional, non-controversial question. Do you think the baby looks like you, the one in the womb? That, what do you think? Let's see it again. I think he, I think he has your mouth. <laughs> I think he has my nose. And nose. He has your nose and mouth. Um, and is, is uh, Levy going to share in your Nobel Prize one day if he made the connection on the bench at Stanford? Levy, Levy will have his own Nobel Prizes, I promise. That. I have no doubt. All right, why don't we go on to segment two? And again, I'll remind everybody, if you have questions, just put them in the chat box and they'll be sent on to me. Okay, so we move on to remote care and telemedicine. Wait a second, let's get there. So uh, our excitement and vision about uh, maternal fetal telemedicine starts from COVID-19. Uh, being best uh, requires commitment and therefore with the COVID-19 outbreak, not surprisingly, Shiba was first to open a pregnant COVID-19 antepartum unit. Here you can see me uh, during the, that's me, during the first C-section in the COVID-19 antepartum unit. Um, you can see me, but I encountered genuine difficulties uh, seeing anything with all the protective equipment on me. So, um, of course, the challenge with telemedicine for pregnancy is dealing with two remote patients. One of them is at home. Uh, the other is within the first patient's room. And, uh, and indeed, because of this great challenge, we started using telemedicine for pregnant women in the first stage under our close supervision in the pregnancy antepartum unit. And um, to reach out, to reach our second patient, the fetus, beyond the standard equipment used for telemedicine in other disciplines, we partnered with Heromed. Let me show you the equipment. Ah, oh, it's slide. With Heromed and Parson Moore to provide women with cutting edge remote fetal monitoring and ultrasound solutions. Uh, uh, one of our brightest and most uh, committed residents, Dr. Michal Exerod, was pregnant at that time, at that time point. So she was the first to try the equipment on herself. Um, Michal, by the way, is one of the, our most innovative uh, residents. And she's working with me currently on a very cool project of uh, precision treatment for gestational diabetes. We won't be talking about it today, but I hope we will be in the very close future. And uh, as with other innovative projects, our department leadership, uh, Professor uh, Eyal Sivan, uh, Professor Shali Mazaki, and uh, Professor Boaz Weiss, head of the ultrasound uh, unit, were very supportive and hands-on and hands -on from the beginning, as you can see. One of the interesting things we discovered that even uh, ultra-Orthodox patients that never had a smartphone easily learn, easily learn to use the remote ultrasound and fetal monitoring probes by themselves with us only uh, supervising remotely. So uh, after the successful pilot in the antepartum COVID-19 unit, our next uh, two steps are pilots starting within the next few weeks of post-date and high-risk pregnancy follow-up at home. So this is kind of a small sentence, but this is a, a big revolution. If we will be able to follow our patients when they stay at home or maybe at work, uh, it, it's going to change everything we do. Um, and as we move uh, forward with these projects, again, uh, we keep thinking of the potential global impact. And that returns me to your question earlier. Uh, our long, our long-term goal is uh, just as I can treat from my office, and here you see me doing it, 
a woman in the antepartum COVID-19 unit or at Tel Aviv or at Haifa, I can chat with you on Zoom, on Zoom from my office. Uh, I hope uh, the time is not, not in the too far future. We will be able to treat a patient uh, that is located remotely. And actually our current hurdles um, preventing us from treating a pregnant patient in the United States or somewhere else are not technology, but actually more regulation. And I hope we will also be able to overcome these. Um, Brian, back to you for some discussion. All right, let's do that. So let me, uh, let, let me get off your last point on, um, on telemedicine. Obviously COVID greatly accelerated by years, uh, telemedicine. As an OBGYN, which in particular, uh, there's nuances and subtleties. What are your concerns about the expansion of telemedicine is for OBGYN? So I tell you, um, I don't think the, I don't think I'm concerned about uh, any uh, risk of uh, telemedicine. I'm more concerned of risks in the beginning that may uh, prevent telemedicine from succeeding. So let's say if we talk about uh, following pregnant women at home. We are being very, very careful and um, thinking of all possible risks that may happen. Uh, let's say there's a patient at home and we're doing the monitor, she's connected to our fetal heart rate monitoring and there's a deceleration in the fetal heart rate, which may indicate that the fetus is uh, uh, under some kind of suffer or it is his or hers oxygenation is not uh, perfect. So what we are doing is we are all set in a case of a fetal heart rate deceleration. So the patient can in minutes change the mode from being at home or being at work, uh, reaching Sheba in less than 30 minutes. Currently that's, our, uh, that's one of our inclusion and exclusion criteria. All patients that want to use, uh, tele pregnant patients that want to use telemedicine must be in half an hour journey from a medical center, which may be Shiba or another medical center that works with us. So if there is a risk we identify remotely, they're able to come quickly to the hospital. And in some cases we are even set if needed, if we discover deceleration or other kinds of problems in the ultrasound, we are set for them to come directly to C-section. So um, the important thing with a remote care for pregnant women is being able to behave as if they were in the emergency room or in the labor and delivery room and being able to convert quickly from a calm uh, uh, at home care to very uh, abrupt medical care at the hospital. Mm. This is, I, I know this kind of maybe a vague uh, and strange question. There's probably hundreds of millions of pregnant women today, obviously, who would tremendously benefit from access to you. Telemedicine, particularly to the developing world, will bring cases onto your screen in your office where you are going to see things that you know you, you, that there's nothing can be done for them, I assume, or they're, they're too far from a medical center or too far from help. That's going to be, a, that's going to be challenging for, for doctors practicing telemedicine like you. No, 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 that's, a great, that's a great question. I, actually, I take, I take that question in two parts. You know, the first part we're dealing with, and we started dealing with only in the, in the last few weeks, is what do we do? So we, we're talking about starting treating gestational diabetes in India. So in India, there are 4 million uh, deliveries every year, similar to the United States. Of them, there's a high rate of uh, diabetes in India for, for many reasons. So we have about half a million uh, women with diabetes in India. Of course, Sheba cannot uh, reach out all these women. So here comes the integration. So, you know, we're, we said we're talking today about three themes of innovation. We're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, we're talking about telemedicine, and we're talking about precision medicine. But actually, uh, these themes and also other themes that we're not talking about today um, all integrate. Because if we can use uh, AI tools, we can improve our ability to follow patients at India that we don't talk with them every day, but actually they use our uh, AI-based uh, diabetes app. So um, digital 
And telemedicine is not only about reaching patients that are remote, but also about uh, scalability. Scalability of good treatment from to places that have, uh, I just say that, scalability of good treatment. And, you know, regarding your question about not being able to treat things that we currently don't see, um, it's a good question, but, you know, I think I prefer to see everything and then do my best to treat it. Beautiful. So uh, many of us have heard about, uh, through ultrasound and through uh, uh, antepartum testing, uh, heart abnormalities, et cetera. Is it possible to predict from ultrasound abnormalities in the brain like autism? Mm. So, you know, th this is really, actually I had a very interesting case today in the clinic. So this is something that is really changing. So for many years, we, we had the genetic testing that could, could give us details about uh, some types of uh, brain disorders. And we had the ultrasound for anatomy survey that allowed us to see structural problems, but ultrasound didn't serve for knowing anything really about the brain of the fetus. I mean, if the, there was a, a hemorrhage within the brain, we could know that. If there was CMV infection, we could see that, but we couldn't really see uh, the brain development. And you know, and the, 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 the advantages, advance, advances in ultrasound in the last three, four years, uh, allowing us to see the sulcation and gyration of the brain and the adding of uh, MRI for fetal brain has stepped us ahead to being able to assess. Uh, it's actually, you know, currently we're still only assessing normality, but I think in the not too far future, and I'm talking about years, not more than that, we were able to assess uh, IQ and things like that using ultrasound. So uh, I believe, and you know, autism remains an enigma, but I believe we may be able to at least some types of uh, communication difficulties we will be able to identify using ultrasound. Hmm. One quick question, was anything learned from doc, it was Dr. Axelrad's, uh, she, you, she, did, was there anything learned from her pregnancy and her use of the equipment? Oh, a lot was learned. A lot really? was learned. So, so, so I tell you, I, it, it, it was really, it was really amazing. Doctor, the, what that Dr. Axelrod did, you know, there's, there's a big difference between when you, you think, you know, when you talk about uh, high tech, you have the people that have, uh, uh, think about the user and the same must be in medicine. You know, we think about, okay, we'll give our patients uh, a phone and an ultrasound probe and a monitor probe, and then we tell them start doing this and that. But it's really hard, and, and, and though we, we, are, we are all very detailed people, it's very hard to imagine all details. And, uh, and you know, it's all kinds of small details, like it, it, we're talking about, let's say in that case, we were talking about uh, women Within the within the COVID nineteen antepartum unit, so one of the things uh, Dr. Exel noticed was we have to give them the ultrasound gel together with the uh, together with it and show them where to place it because because usually who does it is the physician. So it's all kinds of small details we didn't mm -hmm. think about in the protocol. Um, yes, it was really important. Excellent, thank you. Let's go on to segment three. So. Our last theme for today is uh, precision medicine. And I'd like to share with you a story in the beginning. So the baby I'm holding here uh, may seem to you like just, just any other baby. And actually, thanks to innovation, that's exactly what she is, just another healthy baby. However, her sto uh, story is worth mentioning. Uh, Maya came to my clinic after her first pregnancy was complicated by early onset growth restriction, and unfortunately uh, resulted in uh, intrauterine fetal, fetal death. Based on uh, standard of care, I treated Maya with uh, low-dose aspirin and low molecular weight heparin, but despite this treatment, uh, she developed again a severe early onset uh, growth restriction that was around 24 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, uh, things happened that that week I received for review a study from Barcelona showing that in women with early onset growth restriction, 
uh, treating them with a new medication that I studied in uh, Stanford, but in mice, a new medication called pravastatin may improve uh, fetal outcome, extend uh, latency to delivery, that is delaying preterm birth, and it could also prevent early onset preeclampsia that usually accompanies early onset growth restriction. So I will let Maya share her story with a short video. Uh, because I was already on aspirin and uh, Klexan, uh, Dr. Tsur uh, thought of a very uh, innovative and original uh, uh, treatment. He gave me another uh, pill that called pravastatin uh, that he, he thought might help uh, with the placenta and with the fetus's growth, but there was a huge growth and change after I started taking uh, the pill. Uh, and uh, the blood flow to the uterus, I think it was a bit better. And um, uh, at the end, uh, she was born earlier, but she was born uh, very healthy and baked, as they say, because she was enough uh, time in the uterus at the beginning, and the doctors and everybody were not sure if we'll make it to 35 or even weeks, 30 weeks. So every week and every day uh, basically was a miracle. Uh, and everything that happened uh, to me or I think to her during this pregnancy is a, I think, miracle, maybe medical miracle, I don't know, uh, because nobody thought that she will get to 35 weeks and that she will be uh, at this weight. Uh, she was born uh, 1 kilo uh, 692 grams, which is a lot for me. At this point, Tel Shomer is a high-risk pregnancy. is a great department. Have a great, wonderful team, and they help everything, all of us, a lot. And I think we are here because of them. So, thank you again, and especially Dr. Tour, and uh, for a wonderful idea. And uh, thank you. So. Shiley was sleeping during the video, but she's an amazing baby. And, uh, and I, it's hard for me to share how, how this story is exciting because, you know, we never see that. When we have an early onset growth restriction, all we are able usually to do is we, we just follow the women until we identify the time point where the risk of staying in the uterus is uh, greater than the risk of uh, uh, preterm birth. And we just take the baby out. And it, it never happened to me or to any of my colleagues that you have a growth restricted baby and you start treatment and you and it suddenly changes and it starts growing. It's, it's like, you know, it felt for us like magic. It was really exciting. But the point being is that not all patients would, uh, would benefit from pravastatin uh, and some may actually may cause harm. And our hope in the, in the next, in the second part of this year is we're going to be launching uh, three clinical trials, which on the one hand, they are kind of normal, regular clinical trials. The Utopia trial will be studying investigating pravastatin for early onset uh, growth restriction and early onset preeclampsia. Uh, PT Biome study will be investigating altering the vaginal microbiome for preventing preterm birth and uh, precision diabetes will be investigating uh, various medications for women with diabetes during pregnancy. But what's unique in these studies and uh, to make them possible, we did a lot of hard work uh, establishing the innovation lab, the Women's Health Innovation Lab that is adjacent to our high-risk clinics. What's really unique is we're going to be collecting uh, blood from uh, each of the patients in each of these studies 
to being able to uh, identify biomarkers that will predict response to pravastatin, as well as predict resistance to pravastatin uh, in the case of Utopia trial. So those that will not benefit from this treatment, we can offer them maybe possibly another treatment. And the same in the PT bio study, we'll be predicting those that may benefit from altering the vaginal microbiome. And of course, in uh, the precision diabetes study, that's all the idea. There are many medications for treating diabetes, but it's important to uh, uh, reach very, very quickly to reach uh, good glycemic control in the case of uh, diabetes in pregnancy. And that and identifying in advance what patients will respond to the right medication uh, is really important. So again, I return to our map uh, with a global impact. And in the case of uh, uh, precision medicine, I really hope that the, the second part of the SO with AI, we already reached, we have a few calculators that were published and others coming ahead. With telemedicine, we already accomplished uh, with the antepartum uh, telemedicine in the COVID-19 unit. And with the precision medicine, this is uh, the challenge ahead of us, being able to launch these studies and really uh, reach global impact by uh, identifying, being the first to introduce precision. Precision is used in many fields of medicine and cancer, you don't do anything without precision. But in our field of uh, maternal and fetal medicine, uh, precision is new. And if we'll be able to introduce it, it will be really, really awesome and really increase Shiba's global impact. And uh, maybe we fall before questions about this aspect of our work, um, I'd like to uh, thank my family and especially my wife, Orit, for their support. Uh, Orit and I have been married from the beginning of med school. Um, four of our kids were born during years of uh, clinical training. Uh, many of our birthdays, like this one in this picture, were celebrated while I was on clinical service. Uh, but here we are, still happy together, expecting our fifth son this summer. So uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, for your very much appreciated long-standing support of the Shiba Medical Center. And uh, again, Brian, back to you for questions. Thank you, thank you. First of all, gorgeous family, wow. Um, let me ask you, and I hope I didn't miss it, what, what, to explain a little bit more about the difference between precision OBGYN and non-precision OBGYN. So, so generally, um, um, our clinical practice, we want to prevent preeclampsia. We treat patients with low-dose aspirin. So low-dose aspirin has been uh, proven to uh, reduce the risk of preeclampsia in 10 to 20% of women at risk for preeclampsia. But actually, the other 80% don't benefit from this treatment. So if you ask, uh, is the use of low-dose aspirin use beneficial for the average patient? Yes, it is. Is the use of vaginal uh, progesterone beneficial for the average patient? Yes, it is. Is it useful for the patient we're treating now? Well, not always. Actually, in most of the cases, uh, our treatment that is based on randomized controlled trials on the highest level, highest level of evidence-based medicine is not tailored for our patients. Um, and you know, achieving precision medicine is a great challenge because it's much harder than uh, discovering what medication works best for the average patient. If you want to discover what works best for the average patient, you take 400 women uh, at risk for some complication and you treat 200 with the medication, you don't treat the other 200. If you want to do high level research, you give them a placebo treatment and they don't even know they didn't receive the, the treatment investigated. But all you will, all you reach in the end is what works for an average patient. And, uh, and in other fields of medicine, especially with cancer, this is not good enough anymore. We want to treat the specific patient that is currently in our clinic. And the specific patient may benefit from a treatment that is not the one working for the average patient. Let's say Maya, uh, we just watched, it was treated with the as low dose aspirin and with low molecular heparin that works for the average patient but she actually needed a treatment that works for a special patient, for her. And I hope we will be able to uh, predict 
using uh, state of the art state of the art biomarkers using omics uh, to predict which woman will respond or be resistant to which treatment and again we're talking only about those at risk so if there's a patient at low risk she doesn't have a risk for preeclampsia she's not at risk for preterm birth she's not at risk for gestational diabetes she doesn't need any treatment but once we discover a patient at risk uh, we would be happier to treat her with a with a treatment that works for her. So uh, precision medicine and OBGYN refers to risk, higher risk pregnancies. So I gave the, I gave the example of, of high risk pregnancy, but it's true for everything. It's true for all aspects of women healthcare. So today, because of a uh, time limit, I didn't talk about uh, fertility or IVF, but it's just the same. Currently patients that want to become pregnant they come and we treat them with a specific hormonal protocol. Why do we treat them with it? Because it works for the average patient that wants to become pregnant. But tailoring treatment to the specific patients requires artificial intelligence and use of omics, which can identify. Maybe I should say a bit more about omics because I keep saying that word without explaining what it means. So, Please. so, so, so for many years, um, we used to look at a specific molecule uh, that may be predictive of some complication of response to treatment. But today uh, we use uh, the word omics talks about genomics, proteomics, metabolomics. That's use of uh, many biomarkers together. We investigate in one from one uh, from one simple uh, blood draw. We can investigate many biomarkers and identify which one of them is most predictive for the situation we want. So uh, many times it's used to predict a complication, but we want, in the Women's Health Innovation Center, we want to start using omics for predicting response to treatment. So let me ask you, Avi, is there a tension? We, we were just talking about telemedicine and women at home using a ultrasound gel. Is there a tension between attempting to be more precise while attempting also to let people stay at home and, and essentially use uh, tools on themselves? So they're not using tools on themselves. They're using tools, we're using tools to assess them remotely. We don't have uh, patients treating themselves currently. Uh, we're not there yet. So, um, actually, But are you losing some precision? I assume precision, when you're talking about biomarkers, or, 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 you know, low molecular heparin. There, I, I assume there's very deep blood chemistry, or I don't know what. Um, it, it feels to me like telemedicine and precision medicine could be in conflict. Is that? Am I incorrect? I, I, I really like. I like that question, but I disagree. <laughs> That's the first one you like. <laughs> you don't like any of the questions until now? Well, it's, no, it's the first one I disagree with. So, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> so I tell you, it's. The thing is, you know, um, you don't always need um, the most detail. Uh, you don't need to take blood work for any patient that comes for a clinic visit. You need to do it uh, in the case of pregnancy, uh, in the beginning of pregnancy once to predict risk and tailor treatment if needed. You need to do it for IVF once when you choose the uh, treatment protocol. You need to do it a few times when you treat patients with uh, gynecologic oncology complications. But um, so I don't think there's really tension. You just need to, to, to use each thing on the right time. I mean, the first, I think um, one of the thing is, one of the things we talk about at Chiba when we talk about telemedicine is using hybrid visits. So not all visits are telemedicine. We can meet the patient for the first time. We can meet them for an hour and go into detail and take a sophisticated blood test. But then in the next, next week, after we saw them this week, all they need is for us to see the glucose levels and see that the baby is moving and his heart rate is okay. We can do it remotely. And then two weeks later, they come back again to the clinic so we can do a more sophisticated ultrasound. So, so in some ways, the answer to your question is a hybrid treatment. Got it. So we have another non-pregnancy question. Um, in the U.S. and Canada, women are frequently made to feel ashamed or embarrassed about their periods. And according to research, the shaming comes from those closest to them. Is this something that you see in Israel and how do you address it? 
the, the, could you please repeat the beginning of the question? Uh, the, 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 some, in, in U.S. and in Canada, sometimes women are made to feel ashamed about their menstruation. And that comes from, uh, research shows that it comes from uh, clo people close to them. Do you see this in Israel? Uh, and if so, how do you address it? So, you know, Israel is, uh, like the United, uh, United States, is very diverse. We have different populations. Um, you know, it's, to be honest, it's something uh, as physicians, we don't go into, uh, into such kind of, uh, one of the things, you know, for, for me, I must say that, you know, any, anytime I see uh, some pregnancy complication or something like that, I'll tell you in a second how it relates. I see sometimes uh, uh, women uh, blaming themselves, you know, when there's early pregnancy loss or things like that. I, one of the things I learned, it's really important to let them know it's nothing they, nothing they did cause it and nothing they would have done would have prevented it. And, you know, I think it's the same for any physiologic condition such as menstruation. It's important to understand it's physiologic and it's good, but, you know, we don't, uh, as physicians, we don't educate our patients' environment. So there's not really a lot that we have been doing about it so far. Avi, on behalf of all of us, we want to thank you for the work you're doing. It's amazing uh, at, at the individual patient level, at the medical center level, and really at the global level, the, the inventions you've come up with, the cooperation, you really represent the best of Sheba. And uh, so proud, those of us supporting the medical center are so proud to be supporting your work. And I want to let everybody know that, uh, you know, it, it, there's 10,000 medical professionals with Sheba. Maybe Avi is in the top, you know, maybe we have one of the best here, but there's 10,000 dedicated, caring, smart, thinking people like this. And when you support the work, when you, uh, when you support the American Friends of Sheba, Can Canadian Friends of Sheba, you're actually... Uh, your, your funds flow through to people who are doing thing, amazing things for individual human beings, uh, for Israel as a country, and for society as a whole. So uh, uh, on behalf of all of us, Avi, I want to thank you so much for your time, willingness to do this for us. And uh, we're expecting to hear, um, wh when's the, the due date for uh, the baby in the picture? August 10th. August 10th, okay. I hope you're getting a, any some kind of sleep right now. But, but thank you very much uh, for this. We're, we're, we're deeply appreciative and uh, really so honored to have you as part of, uh, as part of Sheba. Thank and you I'd very like, much. Thank you, Abby. And uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Nash, the vice chair of the American Friends of Sheba, uh, Shoshana Zar. Thank you, Dr. Zor. That was remarkable. And thank you to Brian for moderating today's fascinating discussion. On behalf of the Daughters of Shiva, we are grateful for your joining today's event and your support of Shiva Medical Center. Donations made in association with today's virtual salon will directly support the incredible work of Dr. Soor and the Women's Health Innovation Center at Shiva. To make your gift today, please click the donate link in the chat. No gift is too small or too big. We thank you for your support. Have a great day and be well.